Have you ever wondered who the worst comic book artist is? I'm sure many names cross your mind, but I guarantee you no one even comes close to the comic book artist Len Lawson. At an initial glance, Lawson appeared to be a talented and promising young individual on his path to becoming Australia's top selling comic book artist of all time. But this is where his story would take a turn that no one would expect. Hidden behind this rising star was a sinister human being who exploited his artistic talents to lure young women and indulge in his most perverse fantasies. Despite the gravity of his offenses, the Australian justice system failed to keep him in custody, letting him go where he was able to continue victimizing even more individuals. Weirdly enough, even after capturing him and sentencing him to death, the system released him, enabling him to continue his reign of terror. Tragically, the consequences of this decision was devastating. Just a few months after being released, Lawson reached a breaking point and forcefully entered a school where he held 150 innocent students hostage. The situation escalated further and resulted in the deaths of some of the students. This story isn't focused on their artistic abilities, but rather delves into the depths of his horrifying character. This is the story of the worst comic book artist ever. Leonard Lawson, or known as Len Lawson, was born in Wagga Wagga, Australia in 1927. His father was a local celebrity as he was a talented boxer known as the Wagga Walloper. Even at a young age, Lawson was a very gifted student and at the top of his classes, but his real talent was art. During the early 1940s, Australia's comic book industry experienced a significant upswing. Due to the ban on importing American comics, local publishers sought local talent. Renowned artist and publisher Sid Miller, known for co-creating the iconic character Chesty Bonds, which had become one of Australia's most popular comic strips, organized a national competition. At the young age of 15, Lawson emerged as the winner, marking his entry into the commercial realm of comic book artistry and securing his first notable achievement. In 1945, at the age of 17, he had his first published comic book called Peter Jury, which was a full-length adventure included in Sid Miller's monster comic publications. The next year, at the age of 18, he got married and had his biggest career break when he wrote and illustrated all the stories in the very first issue of Action Comics. Since American comics were banned, this was not the same Action Comics by DC publications that featured Superman. This was published by H.J. Edwards. The first issue featured heroes like Spencer Steele, who is exploring the universe in a not-so-far-off future of 1956. There is also a speed racer, Johnny Starr, in his adventures of Detective Michael Justice. But the second issue of Action Comics debuted the character who would become Len's most famous of all, the Lone Avenger. The character is similar to the Lone Ranger, as they were both cowboys who fought bad guys, but he would wear a white hat and had a red mask that concealed his secret identity. The action comic had been an anthology, but the Lone Avenger soon took over the entire book and would continue his crime-fighting run for over 13 years. Kids all over Australia, New Zealand, and Fiji joined the fan club and bought Lone Avenger toys and outfits. Len produced other popular characters for action comics, including another cowboy, this one called the Hooded Rider, and a wild jungle woman in Diana, Queen of the Apes. But the Lone Avenger had the biggest following, selling 70,000 copies per issue. By the early 1950s, Lawson seemed to be doing very well. He had a very successful career, making equivalent to about $10,000 a month now, and was happily married with three kids. Even with all this fame and fortune, something dark was lurking inside of him. On May 7, 1954, Lawson hired five Sydney models. Two were aged 15 and the others were 18, 21, and 23. He wanted them for a calendar that he said he was going to publish. He picked them up from the studio at about 9.30 a.m. and then stopped in St. Leonard's to buy some sandwiches for the day's supposed picnic ambience. Lawson drove them from Terry Hills and they walked through the thick bush. One of the girls asked why he wanted to take their pictures way out in the middle of nowhere, to which he replied, I'm paying for this day's work and you will do what you are told. Lawson then proceeded to tell the young girls that he won't be alive when the calendar comes out because he has cancer. The models were horrified and saddened. Lawson told them he was planning to kill himself rather than endure the agonizing death. He told them that he was gonna shoot himself in the head. Lawson then took a sawn off rifle from his backpack, loaded it, and then began to say he was going to kill himself. The girls pleaded with him not to. He abruptly turned the rifle on them, telling them to lay on their stomachs. He told them that he was going to tie them up so they couldn't stop him from shooting himself. Once he tied them up and put tape over their mouths, 
Then the true purpose became clear. Lawson began removing and cutting off their clothes. He threatened to kill them if they resisted. He raped two of the girls and then tried again with the third, but abruptly stopped. Lawson then untied the victims, paid them each their $6 fee, and drove them to the pharmacist because one of the girls wanted to go there. The craziest thing is he acted like what he did wasn't a big deal at all, and this kind of went about his day as if nothing happened. Once inside the pharmacy, the girls called their parents and the police. The police acted swiftly and arrested him while he was still sitting in his car outside. While in court, he pleaded not guilty and said everything he did was consensual. He said that the only guilt he had was because he betrayed his wedding vows. After hearing the girls' testimonies, the jury quickly found Lawson guilty and sentenced him to death. His wife instantly divorced him and moved away. While awaiting for his death sentence, he tried to change his plea to being insane, but after evaluation from the psychiatrist, they found he wasn't. But while in prison, he was a model inmate. He found religion, taught some of the younger prisoners how to read, and even painted some nice murals throughout the prison. Lawson got extremely lucky, because while he was waiting for his execution, New South Wales, where he was staying, abolished the death penalty in 1955. So they changed his sentencing to 14 years, but since he was such a model prisoner, they reduced it down to only seven years. On May 24th of 1961, he was released from jail. He got an apartment and a car from the money his mother gave him. Immediately, he started hiring prostitutes and tried to live out some of his dark fantasies. When that didn't help, he drove a few towns over to Moss Valley, where he went to the Church of English Grammar School and introduced himself to Jean Turnbull, who was the head mistress. He said he was there to write a novel and wanted to know if he could watch and observe the girls. Oddly enough, they agreed to let some stranger guy hang out and watch the girls. I guess they didn't know who he was, you know, obviously no internet back then, and probably didn't look up the local paper. During this time, he would go to a local art supply store where a 16-year-old girl named Jane Bauer worked. He charmed her and he even befriended her parents. Many occasions, he would ask if he could paint her, and her family agreed to let their daughter pose for him. Then one day, on November 6th, after he was done eating dinner at their house, he asked if he could bring their daughter Jane back to his apartment so he may paint her again. The parents agreed. While back at his apartment, he filled up a sock with sand and knocked her out. He then tied her up and raped her. When she started to come to, he began to strangle her, and then grabbed a knife and stabbed her. He then took his pencil and wrote, God forgive me, Len, on her stomach. The parents became worried when she didn't come home, so they went looking for her. They went to Lawson's apartment, but no one answered. So the next day at 7 a.m., they came back and broke down the door where they found Jane's dead body. They immediately called the police, and they started to figure out a plan for a nationwide search. But that wouldn't be necessary, as Lawson made his whereabouts well known. The previous night, Lawson sat in his car and wrote a suicide note to his mother and father. Dear mom and dad, I have done a shocking and dreadful thing. Whatever this monster that moved into my body is, it did it with vengeance this time. He went on to say they were sorry and he was going to kill himself. But when the time came, he decided not to. Instead, he went back to the Church of England Grammar School with a rifle, 167 rounds of ammunition, the knife he used on Jane Bauer, and a bunch of pre-cut rope. Just after 9 a.m., Lawson entered the school's chapel, where 150 students were at, with the headmistress, Jane Turnbull. When Miss Turnbull asked what he wanted, he said he was going to hold all the girls hostage until 12 o'clock, and that he already killed someone else, and his demand was to speak to three people. You know who those three people that he wanted to speak to that was in his demand letter? A nun who visited him while he was in prison, the reigning Miss Australia, and then an Olympic athlete, Marlene Matthews. He told the teachers to continue with their sermon and to continue singing their hymns. He wrote a letter and gave it to another teacher to pass it around the school grounds, saying that if anyone calls the police, he would start killing the students. Shortly after, the police arrived, and Lawson said since the police had arrived, he was going to start shooting people. Miss Turnbull asked him to shoot her instead of the students, as she had already lived a very long life. She slowly got closer to him, trying to distract him and then at the right moment, jumped into action, grabbing the gun and trying to keep it aimed away from the students. As they struggled for the control of the gun, a bunch of students ran up to help Miss Turnbull. During the struggle, Lawson fired five shots. The police outside saw the struggle and tried to break down the door, but it had been secured by Lawson. Miss Turnbull pushed Lawson closer to the window, where the police broke the glass and reached inside and grabbed the gun. 
Then they got the door broken down and rushed in and subdued Lawson. Of the five shots that Lawson got off, one of them hit and instantly killed a 15-year-old girl, Wendy Lascombe. When arrested and down at the police station, he said he never intended to harm anyone. He pleaded insanity and not guilty to killing Jane Bauer. The psychiatrist assessed him and found he was sane at the time of the killing of the girl. On April 4th, 1962, it took the jury 17 minutes to find him guilty of murder and gave him a life sentence. So you'd think, now behind bars, this would be the end of Lawson's reign of terror. But you'd be wrong. On June 18th, 1972, they held a concert for prisoners as entertainment. Afterwards, the performers, including three dancers, were invited to enjoy some light refreshments organized by the Arts and Crafts Committee, of which Lawson served as the secretary. Lawson would often paint massive murals on the walls of the prison. Inside the rec room were many of his remarkable portrait paintings, and this is where the prisoners and performers mingled. Sharon Hamilton, a 23-year-old dancer, found herself captivated by his portrait of President John F. Kennedy. Just as she was admiring his artwork, Lawson tapped her on the shoulder and requested her to sign a visitor's book. Sharon complied and expressed her admiration for Lawson's work, commenting on its beauty. Shortly after, it was, it was announced that the visit had concluded. Standing beside Sharon Hamilton, Lawson was called upon to deliver a speech of gratitude. In an instant, he grabbed her and pressed a knife against her throat while holding another to her back. He told everyone to leave the room except for her and that if anyone tries to stop him, he will kill her. However, this time, Lawson wasn't dealing with frightened schoolgirls or models that he lured to the wilderness. He was dealing with criminals and none of them wanted to see a young girl hurt. Two of the prisoners lunged at Lawson, with one delivering a punch to his face. Lawson staggered backwards, and a prison guard intervened, grappling with him while the other prisoner freed Sharon Hamilton from his grasp. Lawson dropped one of the knives, and the other one was wrestled from him by a second guard who aided in subduing him. Sharon was left injured, bleeding from small cuts on her neck, hands, and back. However, the deeper wounds she bore were emotional and psychological. Lawson faced trial in August of 1972 and received an additional five-year sentence. But as for Sharon Hamilton, she found herself serving a sentence in her own psychological prison. She struggled to get work, go out, or socialize, as Lawson seemed to haunt her at every turn. What she appeared to be experiencing was later identified as post-traumatic stress disorder. Though the condition was not fully understood or acknowledged at the time, from 1974 to 1976, Sharon sought treatment for her psychological issues in a private hospital. Tragically, that hospital happened to be Clemsford, where destructive deep sleep and electroshock therapies were practiced, resulting in deaths of 43 patients and subsequent Royal Commission investigation. In 1976, Sharon received a settlement of nearly $100,000 from the state government, acknowledging their negligence had contributed to Lawson's attack on her. However, life did not become easier for Sharon. She endured a terrible relationship with a doctor and battled depression. In 1978, she tragically took her own life. While behind bars, Leonard Lawson continued to paint and generously donate his artwork to charitable causes, raising tens of thousands of dollars. In 1994, the possibility of parole was raised for Lawson. However, Wendy Lascombe's brother, along with several other survivors of the school siege, protested his parole. The government listened and Lawson remained confined in jail. In 1999, Lawson, now recognized as Australia's longest serving prisoner, was interviewed for a program 60 Minutes. He portrayed himself as a kind old man yearning for the opportunity to feel grass beneath his feet once again before he dies. However, no one was willing to be deceived again. Lawson passed away on November 29, 2003, at the age of 76, having spent a total of 48 years behind bars. Len Lawson stands out as one of the most sinister comic book artists in history. Despite initially showing promise and talent in his artistic abilities, his true nature as a predator and manipulator of young women emerged. Lawson's disturbing actions left a trail of devastation and trauma in his wake, impacting the lives of his victims and their families. Even the school, where he held all those students hostage, closed down and now sits abandoned. Lawson leaves behind a legacy of darkness and suffering forever marked as one of the worst comic book artists of all time.